was a crime that shocked the nation. A young woman brutally raped and murdered by a violent criminal who should never have been on the streets. The murder in Melbourne of ABC staffer Jill Maher would expose major flaws in the criminal justice system and ignite public outrage on a massive scale. His whole pattern of behaviour was violent, aggressive, offending against women. This wasn't any other job. From the moment police saw the images, he became the number one suspect. Um, we had, in our view, precious little time. If it had have turned out that Jill was still alive, that may have been a catalyst to then kill her. Would there be any reason why anything of Jill Ma would be at your house? We advised Paul that we seized the SIM card at, uh, at his home address. Paul's words were, if there's a God, please let it be Jill's. As I was saying her name, I had to take a deep breath. We've got this bastard, you know, we've got him. In my view, um, had we not caught Adrian Bailey, he wouldn't have stopped uh, and we would be dealing with a serial killer. It is inevitable, but so wrong, that Jill Maher will be defined by those few obscene minutes from the moment her chance meeting with a monster was recorded on CCTV until her senseless death in an East Brunswick laneway. But she was so much more than a moment in time. She was a friend, a colleague, a confidant, a wife, a daughter. It's often said that you don't speak ill of the dead, but you can't find anyone who would speak ill of Jill when she was alive. Weeks earlier, when her father, George, had a stroke in Perth, she flew to his side and demanded he recover so her future children would have a grandfather to play with. He put it simply, Gillian just loved life. Like many young workers, Jill went out for drinks with friends on a Friday night, but she would never make it home. With most homicides, the investigation begins at a static crime scene. But this wasn't a normal murder probe, as police were not sure they were actually dealing with a homicide. Soon it became obvious this wasn't a case of sleeping over at someone's place after a night of partying. Jill's phone was dead, and she hadn't accessed her bank accounts, discounting thoughts that she may have engineered her own disappearance. The difference is between a missing person homicide and a, um, any normal homicide is that we start with, with nothing. There's uh, no crime scene, uh, no uh, dead person. There's no general trail of breadcrumbs. And so we really have to work hard to try and piece that together. Jill was still missing by the Sunday morning, which at that time our missing persons crew, which was part of the homicide squad, were notified that there was a potential that this was a suspicious missing person. I'd taken five days off uh, and I got a phone call from Dave Butler. Oh, we've got a job. Um, this lady from the ABC has gone missing. Um, so from that point on, I think I spoke to different people within the crew, but in particular Dave, um, at least two, three times a day. When Jill failed to arrive home, the first moves to find her occurred on Facebook as Jill's husband, Tom, reached out to their friends for help. She didn't appear uh, on the Monday, it really crystallised for me and I um, formed the strong view that she was probably dead. The, 
the classic in this case was that her handbag was found on the Monday morning in the laneway. Now, the laneway was searched on the Saturday and it wasn't there. Either the police have missed that or someone has placed the bag back at that location. So the handbag became an issue. It turned out to be Jill's handbag. And that handbag was discovered uh, by a passerby in the laneway just off Sydney Road. The bag had certainly been planted there uh, overnight between Sunday and Monday. And that concerned us because there had already been a line search done, meticulous line search done on the Saturday morning. And there was no handbag there. And that lane had been checked. We subsequently learnt that the handbag had been picked up on the Saturday morning by one of the shopkeepers along there and taken into his shop. And he didn't report that until he was approached by police some days later and then acknowledged that he got a call from his daughter about Gillian's disappearance. And he decided he'd better go back and put the handbag back in the laneway, again without telling police. Now, that's of concern that an individual would do that in such a serious case. That would have pointed to something more sinister earlier on. And we knew there was a problem with Gillian's disappearance, but the handbag was a problem. It was just one of those jobs that really um, really got people thinking and talking and the community were really concerned about her and her being missing. Tom was told firmly but politely that the homicide squad begins with those closest to the victim and then works its way out in ever-increasing circles. I, I don't think there's any big secret about that. Uh, at the start of an investigation, if we have no clue um, where to go, uh, it would make sense, wouldn't it, that we would uh, focus in on the people who, um, who know Jill uh, the best or, or a missing person the best. After Jill's disappearance, Many on social media speculated that Tom was the killer. It was as though they wanted him to be the offender, because if it was someone close to Jill, there wasn't somebody still out there who could go after someone else. He, Tom, was the safe option. You know, I spoke to her before I left work, and she was great spirits. Everyone who was there that night said she was in really good spirits. So, um, I don't know. I don't know. Because we just don't know what's happened, we have to, we really do have to dig deep. And that can be quite difficult, not only for, uh, for Tom in this case, but it can also be difficult for us because we're having to probe and ask questions and do things that um, really aren't, would, would not be pleasant for anyone on the receiving end. And, um, and so by the end of that process, um, what we hope to do is we hope to uh, be able to determine one way or the other, um, is this person somebody we should suspect? OK, you've got to focus on him, but don't do it to the detriment of all the other information comes in. So it was about collecting video footage, uh, doing a whole range, but also dealing with the calls that are coming in. Some people are saying, oh, I think it might be. You split your crew up so that you still do all those, but on one side, you have to get to the point where Tom Ma was completely eliminated. We were able to eliminate Tom um, uh, reasonably quickly in this case. And the important thing with that was, let's say, um, let's say we never solved the case. The important thing with that is, is that um, we confront the media and we can say, listen, it's not him. We've proven uh, beyond any doubt that it's not him. And so excluding somebody um, is as important as uh, finding the actual killer, in, in, in my view. When they went and collected the CCTV footage, at 4.30, Tom is walking down Sydney Road 
and then later on it was established that her phone, Jill's phone, was on the Tullamarine Freeway near Moreland Road at 4.30. So all of a sudden is they're not, you know they're not together, you've done a forensic examination of Tom's flat, there's nothing there, you satisfy yourself predominantly on the video and sometimes there's a logical reason for your phone, his phone was switched off because he had a flat battery. Um, and we were able to corroborate his account. His movements on the, uh, uh, at the time, on the night, um, it, everything matched. Just uh, hope, just hope somebody needs to saw something or she just walked through the door. We were lucky enough to have a, a very uh, fastidious crime scene examiner come along to, to examine that bag who journeyed further up the laneway, much further up the laneway, and located some cigarette butts, uh, sorry, some cigarettes that had, but were unsmoked, uh, and, um, and an ABC, a pencil with the ABC logo on it. And as he looked around further, he observed an area of flattened turf uh, that he, and he formed the view that uh, to him looked like a rape scene. Had, had we not had the handbag scene, so to speak, uh, we may never have discovered that, that scene. Social media interest in the case became an avalanche of theories, speculation and anger. Interestingly, the investigators refused to engage, making a conscious decision that they didn't need the extra pressure. Yeah, it was just amazing. And it just shows you there are, the community are sensitive to what's happening. By the end of that first Monday, you know, there was a real media storm surrounding the investigation. Members of the media were following us up and down Sydney Road and, and going into the shops uh, that we'd, we'd been into. There was a massive interest uh, out of Brunswick and it was, it was apparent everything we did. Oh, there was no doubt that the teams were under pressure. This wasn't any other job. Well, everyone wanted to help. In those initial stages, no one really knew what had happened. Um, we, we certainly had our our thoughts as to, as to what we thought had happened. But no one really knew. Everyone wanted to find her. Everyone wanted to know um, what had happened and everyone was hoping that she was going to be OK. made a, a conscious decision. I'm not reading or listening to anything in the media. I just, um, and, and to be quite frank with you, I didn't have the time. Good grounded detectives uh, make good homicide investigators, but really it is boots on the ground. It is common sense. It is engaging with people. Um, and it's, uh, I guess, attention to minute detail. It's really about how they work in a team. It's about being very thorough and professional about it, about the level of support you provide to the, um, the deceased family. Sometimes you might use a particular technique and you think you're on the money, it goes horribly wrong, and you're back to square one. On Tuesday morning, homicide detectives had to make some tough decisions. They had sourced some CCTV footage from a Sydney Road boutique, which showed Jill outside the shop at 1.43am, her last known sighting, just 450 metres from her home in Brunswick. A member of the public had rung up, um, saying that they thought they had Jill on some CCTV, uh, and they thought he, uh, she was being chased. Um, and so we went and watched that, and we followed her through the CCTV up Sydney Road. Um, eventually led us to the footage that, that most people have seen where uh, Bailey and Jill interact just by, by good fortune really in front of that in front of that doorway. From the moment police saw the images, he became the number one suspect. I 
I still remember watching that footage for the first time, standing in the shop and just thinking, there's something not right about it. They're just her body language, she seems uncomfortable, she seems reluctant to go with him. And from my point of view, that was something we needed to, we needed to deal with at that time. At a bare minimum, he was someone, the last person to have an interaction with her. On the other end of the scale, potentially he was, he was the offender. We, we certainly had some concern around uh, whether to release it or not, uh, to release the CCTV. Um, I guess one thing to remember is, is that uh, whilst uh, I've made the decision that Jill is dead, um, what if she's still alive? Um, that, would, that would be a, a concern to me. Um, having worked in this theme for a long time, my, my, my strong view was that uh, by that stage she was dead. But could I be wrong? Um, and these are the sorts of things that, uh, as an investigator, um, uh, as it turned out, I was right. But it would have certainly haunted me if I was wrong. And once we had that CCTV, we've then got to make a decision as, as investigators and as the team, the best way to use that. Because at the end of the day, our focus is not only on the solve, but also the Supreme Court trial. And we don't know whether it's going to be a plea of guilty or not. So that would have been a pretty strong debate, wouldn't it? Uh, it, was a, it was a strong debate. Wouldn't have been your decision alone? Is there a round table over this sort of thing? Um, I'd rather not go there. Oh, OK. And at that time, we were focusing on the movements of Gillian's mobile phone. On the Saturday morning, early hours of the morning, the phone was in Brunswick, pinging off a tower in the Brunswick area. And then after some hours, early hours of the morning, that phone started to move. able to, um, without going into too much detail, um, track Jill's phone heading out towards the Gisborne area. It would have been following her, her actual death uh, when her phone was still switched on. And we, we had a, a fairly lucky break with a, a crossover of CityLink, um, a CityLink transaction of Moreland Road um, at a time when Jill's phone was moving through that general area. That then um, gave us, uh, uh, I guess, the first piece of information that Adrian Bailey could have been our man. The crack surveillance squad known as the Dogs was called in for two reasons. To see if he acted suspiciously and to make sure he wouldn't strike again. Again, doesn't mean he killed her, but he did have 17 prior convictions for rape. Well, let's see if he has a phone. So they identify that he has a phone. Oh, hang on a minute. 1.30, his phone is in Sydney Road. 4.30, it's on the Tullamarine Freeway. 5 o'clock, it's in Sunbury. 6 o'clock, it's in Gisborne. And we had a map, and you could track both phones all the way out to Gisborne, and only one phone came back, which was Adrian. So that's pretty compelling evidence? Yeah. From late Wednesday, homicide detectives bunkered down and stopped talking to the media, a sure sign that they were making progress. There was further debate over whether releasing the vision could lead the man to destroy evidence, fabricate an alibi, flee, or self-harm. By Thursday morning, the suspect was confirmed as the man in the blue hoodie. The random and opportunistic nature of the attack led police to believe that this predator would strike again. In the perfect world, you would always try and do some background research on on the individual. In this case, though, um, we had 
in our view, precious little time. In my view, Adrian Bailey was, uh, he was dangerous. Having looked at his prior history, probably unlikely to stop. Um, so we had four or five conversations throughout the day uh, about how the interview um, should be structured, how the arrest should take place. There wasn't much time for us. We, we basically decided we've got to go and get him and um, I'll see what he's got to say. If it had have turned out that Jill was still alive, uh, that, may have, that may have been a catalyst to then kill her. At a predetermined moment, Bailey was grabbed. It would be his last day of freedom. I know that he was sentenced to five years for an indecent assault, uh, of which he did 20 or 22 months, uh, and then fronted back in court, uh, charged with raping six women in St Kilda. Each of those rapes carry a maximum 25 years sentence. He was given a minimum period of eight years, which works out, I think, about 14 months per rape. Had he been given even a cumulative 25 years, the maximum for one, uh, not for the six, but one, then a further 13, 15 women would not have been raped and Jill Maher would still be alive because Adrian Ernest Bailey would still be in jail. How do you interview somebody who has done something which actually repulses you? Um, stay focused on what it's about. Uh, if you get emotionally involved, um, you've lost the battle. No, no, you know what to do. you just got to follow the process. So get the account. Now, bearing in mind, Adrian uh, Bailey had been interviewed um, numerous occasions. He's been convicted of rape. He's done a lengthy um, time in prison. So was he ever going to tell you? I was given the job to do the interview um, for a number of reasons. I'd been out in Brunswick for pretty much three days straight, and I had a, a good knowledge of, of the CCTV and, and Jill's movements and her interaction with, with Bailey. I'd spoken to Tom, so I knew the circumstances surrounding her disappearance. And based on those couple of things, I had a fairly strong view um, as to how I thought the interview should, should play out. And so the decision was made. We discussed it as a crew, um, and the decision was made that I'd do it. Ultimately, in a job like this, everyone has a role. Um, that was my role, and everyone's role um, is assisted by the others around them. You know, you really need to plan your approach on how you deal with some of these uh, interviews um, or these individuals, and uh, it's not easy. We're, there's a lot of very complex personalities out there. So the interview basically started off um, um, Adrian, tell me a bit about yourself. Um, turned out he barracked for Collingwood. Uh, so you might talk about the football for a minute. Then I'm going to interview you about the circumstances surrounding the disappearance and the death of Jill Maher. Are you in any way involved? Oh, no way. In his words, he, he you know, it, this has had nothing, I've had nothing to do with this. Uh, uh, I, I want to help you in whatever way I can, um, but it's not me. When Adrian Bailey was interviewed, I was invited into, um, there's a monitoring room where you can actually watch what's going on in the interviewing room. He's a very confident um, person to the extent that he was quite relaxed initially, quite confident and I think fairly comfortable in the fact that he, he thought he had gotten away with it and that he would get away with it. Then it's, okay, tell me where you were. So he says, tell me where you were from Friday night at around six o'clock till the time that you ultimately went to bed. We wanted him to tell us um, his version, if you like, of what he said um, happened that night, if he was willing to, and ultimately he did. I think to a certain extent, if you expect someone to divulge an event to you as significant as that, you have to have some rapport established. You have to have shown a willingness to listen 
uh, almost to the extent of, of some level of empathy. Um, you've got to really just try and push your emotions aside and just um, stay focused on, you know, trying to get the truth out of the individual in terms of speaking to them, trying to get them to commit to a, some sort of story. And it's not easy. How do you overcome that pressure? I think ultimately... Ultimately, if your task at hand is important enough, you'll, you'll overcome whatever obstacle's in your way. Is he, is he tense? Is he calm? Does, does he look like he thinks he can talk his way out of it? Yeah, my, my impression was at the start of the interview that, that he felt um, quite confident that, uh, that he would be able to talk his way out of, um, out of, um, out of trouble. Then I went into the city with my girlfriend uh, we had an argument. She left me. Um, you know what? I'm worried about women. Women shouldn't walk around on their own. I looked around for two hours. I couldn't find her. And then eventually I went back home. So that's his... But he goes for an hour t just to explain that. And we call it topic. So you go back, so you're in the city? Tell me about that. Yeah, we went to a bar. Which bar? They're all open questions. Then, OK, you had your car. Which car? Tell me about your car. Oh, it's a Holden Barina. He was willing to lie extensively, uh, and we had the evidence to prove that, that he was lying. Um, and so once he committed to that position, we were, we were confident we were going to charge him. Um, I guess he felt he could defeat the police investigation because, let's face it, he's the guy who knows where the body is. A lot of pressure on Dave Butler, uh, and quite clearly a lot of pressure on Paul. At one stage, I thought about coming back in, and then you think, no, Paul's been doing this for four years. There's a break, so the first hour, then Paul starts off and says, um, you told me that you didn't go anywhere else. I want to show you a photograph of your car going under Moreland Road on the Tullamore for Can you explain that to me? No, I can't explain it. You told me you had your phone. Well, your phone is in Sydney Road at 1.30. I can't explain. I don't know why it would be there. And then slowly you go through it. When do we see that confidence start to erode as you start to chip away at his, his story with fact, not just supposition? Yeah, there's a definite point in the interview where I could see his um, attitude, his demeanour, uh, even his complexion change. Um, once he realised that well, perhaps there was some evidence that we had that he wasn't aware of and that was going to discount the account that he'd just spent several hours giving me. He certainly became uncomfortable. He became rattled. Uh, at one point in time, he became angry, um, very angry to the point that they sent another police member to stand outside the door because they were worried he was, he was going to get physical. Um, with me, I never, I never thought that, but nevertheless, there was, there was a degree of anger as he started to realise that he hadn't, he hadn't convinced us that he wasn't involved. So the last question that Paul says is, well, whilst you've been here, we've been searching the house. Would there be any reason why anything of Jill Ma would be at your house? No. He'd had the car cleaned and um, changed the tyres. Um, of course, we don't know any of this uh, in the middle of that week. We know that um, he's had an interaction with Jill in Sydney Road and that we know his car at the relevant time was heading out of the city towards the general vicinity of, of where Jill's phone was or, and where we assumed her body was. We advised Paul that we'd seized the SIM card at, uh, at his home address. And um, Paul's words were, if there's a God, please let it be Jill's. Ron Idles was on holidays in his caravan, but listening to the interview brain. over the phone. Um, think of the evidence, which is contrary to what he's told you. And then one by one, just start to drop that out and uh, see how you go. We had the, the serial number of the SIM card and that was given to um, one of our um, tactical intelligence officers to, to actually do the research on that. She was able to contact um, a Vodafone technician out of ours 
and um, when um, when she got the result, she came down to the interview suite, um, burst in through the door, uh, and screamed out, "It's chills." When I when I told him that we'd found Jill's SIM card at at his home address, it was a fairly significant moment, you know, from an investigative point of view, but also in terms of the dynamics in, in that interview room. You have to show a willingness to understand, even though there's no way anyone can. And there's no way anyone can fathom that he would do that to her. But at that point in time, it's, it's not about what I'm feeling. That SIM card is registered to Jill Ma. Can you explain that? Uh, I know, as I was saying her name, I had to take a deep breath and and concentrate on what I was doing because it was, you know, it was a very significant moment. He, up until that point in time, his, his go-to answer was, I can't explain it, I can't explain it, I can't explain it. And when I told him about the SIM card, he said, I don't want to explain it. He sat back on his chair, uh, he, he paused, and he slightly shook his head the, really the first indication that he perhaps dropped, you know, his facade, dropped that defensive um, mechanism that he was using in terms of his, his lie and, and perhaps we, we just penetrated, you know, a little bit. He just puts his head down. No. And that's when he knew he was No. Gone. Then he says, I don't want to. So they had a break. Um, Paul rang me and he says, well, out of his own way. He just couldn't believe that he was in this position. And so he was he was angry and he wasn't listening to anything I said. I tried to uh, appeal, I guess, um, to any level of compassion he may or may not have, um, hoping that he would tell me what had happened and tell me where, where Jill was. And at that point in time, he wasn't willing to do it. So he leaves and he comes out. He's only out of the room 30 seconds. Adrian hits the buzzer. He comes back in. Well, don't you want me to tell you? And he said, you're going to charge me? And I said, yes, we are. And he said, look, I want to I want to get it off my chest. But then he sort of reverted back to it being about him. And he wanted to negotiate. The way it came across to me as I was listening to it, it was almost like he was the knight in shining armour and, you know, she was the damsel in distress. Uh, it was anything but that, obviously. So at that point, they're telling me live on the phone what he's saying. No. Ultimately, it's his decision what he chose to tell me. And he made the decision to lie for six hours. And inevitably, at the end of that, having, having lied for that, for that amount of time, there's a pressure that builds on him as a result of the conflicting evidence we had. And ultimately, that led to, to a position where he really had no choice but to but to confess. Yeah, this this is Jill's. We've got him. And I still get goosebumps when I when I think about it. The the elation in the room, like just everyone was so pleased that we've got this bastard. You know, we've got him. Which is, I still sort of get a little bit emotional about that because that was the point where we knew that, yeah, hundred percent, he's our man. He can't he can't explain his way out of that. And I said to him. You told me you want to get it off your chest. Now's your chance. And he said to me, he started crying and he said, I fucked up, all right? And then he, look, he didn't just go into divulging what he'd done. It was still really about him at that point in time. It was more about the reasons behind it and how he saw the world as being against him and, um, you know, almost playing it like he was the victim and there was a lot of things that he wanted to get off his chest and he wanted to say and reasonings behind it. And, and we sat there and oh, I sat there and, and, and listened to, you know, to his, his story, for want of a better term. He told us that he wanted to take us to um, uh, to where her body was. He wanted to do the right thing. So he went on and predominantly confessed. We still, at that point in time, when he 
when he'd said that to me, we still didn't know what had happened. We didn't know any details. He had said in a general sense, yes, I'm responsible, and I did it, but we didn't know what, what exactly he'd done. And the end goal in, in this occasion was, really at that point, was actually finding Jill. Um, you know, a confession from him is fantastic, but they wanted to get Jill and return Jill to her parents and to her husband. I was in the car with him when we drove out there. And, uh, you know, it took two hours, really. You know, to me, that's, that was the extension of the interview. I spent all that time with him and had the rapport with him and, and um, to a certain extent, um, wanted to nurse him through that process. You know, I've, no, I've got no sympathy for him, but he was, he was broken at the end of that interview process. We drove around uh, and we kept driving past the same road. Uh, look, it was a concern and there was a level of frustration uh, within the car, definitely. Um, I don't know whether uh, Dave Butler spoken about it, but he was certainly getting frustrated at his inability to just point us directly there. We drove past the same road a number of times and then in the end, I made the decision, well, I'll, I'm going to, I was driving, uh, I'll drive up this road. And to that point in time, he'd been sort of slumped on the, on the side of the door, not really engaging, not, you know, being overly helpful. And he sort of sat up and said, I think this is it. And we turned the car around and he, uh, Probably half a kilometre up the road, he started crying and told me that this is the road. Um, and then, as we drove out further along the road, um, he said, stop, it's right here. And he said, yeah, this is it. Stop here. How on earth he had remembered that was the location, I don't know, because we could never find any connection between him and that area. And I had wanted to actually get him out of the car and, and finish off the interview out at the scene, but he refused to get out. I walked probably 30 or 40 metres to my right um, and located a, an area of um, recently disturbed um, grass. pushed him as far as we needed to and, you know, we, we found, found Jill. Once he'd buried Jill's body, he was driving back and he actually ran out of petrol um, in Black Hill Road. Um, and he was picked up by a member of the public just driving in the air and taken to a service station to get fuel and, and brought back to his car. So once, once he'd been charged and his, his name and face had become public, um, that person was able to see that and, and ring us and say, well, well hey, I, I picked him up on the night. I drove him to this service station. And from there, we were able to get the, the footage of him turning up at, at the relevant time on a relevant night. Once he confessed and, and shown us, you know, where her body was is, you know, the, I guess the prospect of a trial is somewhat reduced. You just never know. It took six days to catch Adrian Bailey. It took six minutes for a magistrate to remand him into custody. I, I get a bit emotional when I think about it, but the lasting memory for me were the comments by Tom on the, the steps of the magistrate's court where, he thanked us for our tireless efforts in, in um, solving the case so quickly, uh, which in missing person cases is, is, is absolutely, absolutely critical. I just wanted to say uh, very briefly that um, despite the fact that uh, this is the worst thing we'll ever go through in our lives, um, I've been really humbled by the support uh, the Australian 
probably like the um, tireless efforts of the police um, and all the friends and family who. So this morning, we'll pay our respects to our friend, our colleague, and there's a very empty space in our office this morning. Is there an anticlimax? Is there a triumph? What goes through your DNA? Um, the um, oh, the investigation is obviously very intense. Um, uh, from me personally, um, you know, I go home at night and I cry. Um, the, um, in this case here, um, you know, something that I guess I have to live with is the, is the, um, the initial investigation that focused on Tom Ma. Um, it was, uh, necessary to do, but, um, when you, when you think about it down the track, um, you're left thinking, geez, we're, we're pretty awful for the, for the way we've treated this poor guy. Not only has he lost his wife, but now he's being treated um, pretty badly by us in, in some respect. And as the, the person in charge of that investigation, uh, I'm the person who's making these decisions about uh, exactly what, how we're going to proceed. Um, so I guess that all comes back to me. So they treated him like a suspect. Then when they found the person who was responsible, their relationship with him, the way he appreciated the work they were doing and held no um, malice towards the way they had done their job. He was, yeah, he's just a really amazing person in the way that he was able to forgive. Um, some people talk about that job as like throwing a hand grenade into the crew because they worked long hours, a um, lot, uh, lot of media attention, a lot of pressure internally. Uh, I know Dave struggled after that for a while. Um, Paul Rowe um, eventually left the homicide squad. I think, uh, again, just the pressure, uh, probably over four or five years. Uh, and then some of the people from forensics who went to that scene, two of them have never come back to work. The responsibility uh, of those teams is for the team leaders to, uh, to monitor their staff. Uh, we have a weekly meeting and uh, the first thing on that agenda is uh, welfare and the second thing is risk. And then we get into operations. Do you look at it with satisfaction, regret, anger? Um, I think you have to look at the case. Uh, each case is another learning experience. Um, um, I, I suppose the bits of this case that I would um, have done slightly differently. Um, but, but overall, um, you just have to um, get up and dust yourself off and move on to the next one. I did it for, you know, like for 25 years and I'm, I'm not a martyr, but, uh, you know, I, I miss my kids' birthdays. <laughs> I miss my daughter's 21st. <laughs> my wife would say, you can build the sandpit, but you don't play in it. I, I learned in the end how to not switch off, but how to, to probably balance, whereas early days, you're trying to establish yourself. Um, and when you go into a house and you're talking to the family of a victim, they look at you, the expectation is, uh, you're gonna solve this, you're gonna give me the answers. So at times there's an enormous amount of mental pressure and I think when you leave that type of position, and in my case, retire, you spend the rest of your time trying to forget. Bailey was off the streets, but for police, it was far from over. Their aim was to build a case so compelling that Bailey would have no alternative but to plead guilty, saving the family the trauma of a graphic trial. It was certainly, I think, on the inside, to a certain extent, it, it was somewhat surreal, given the week we'd had, the investigation, the, the hype around it, the interest in it, uh, the tragedy of it. Bailey had been charged um, by Friday morning. 
Um, I guess it's then when I can slowly start to return to a normal life and I am now reading the newspapers and I am now watching the news and I'm seeing the, the incredible outpouring uh, of, of interest and, um, you know, grief on the part of um, people in the community over Jill's death. Social media acted as a lightning rod in the Jill Maher case, first with curiosity, then anger, and finally, with action. Three days after Bailey was charged, 30,000 people joined an anti-violence demonstration in Sydney Road, Brunswick. The message was clear. They wanted to take back the streets. Just thank you. Simply thank you, and um, I hope they'll put more cameras in here. My immediate impression was, um, Jesus isn't it good that there's so many um, great people out there in the community, you know, that, um, that, you know, that care. She was a young woman simply going about engaging in ordinary activity and died in that process. They were the reasons that it powerfully resonated and drew attention to the kind of uh, crime that it was and the importance of ensuring that as far as possible, people can move around this community in safety. Now, that's a minimum, surely. There was a massive social media campaign demonising Adrian Bailey, which could well have compromised his upcoming trial. The comments varied from people, an outpouring of grief that they wanted to you know, share their feelings with Jill and her family, to people baying for his blood, people wanting him dead, people actually talking about his prior history that they may have known of, all of those types of things. So at one point we actually talked about um, stopping all comments on our page as a way, because at that point it's sub Judas, he's before the courts. The social media is a two-edged sword. It was, it was terrific in getting the community to rally and may even have played a role in solving uh, the police investigation. But it also has led to a kind of a digital lynch mob. While I really appreciate all the support, um, I just would like to mention that um, negative comments on social media um, may hurt um, legal proceedings, so um, please be mindful of that. If you offend and you're found guilty, do time, but twice that's it, according to this text. You're locked up for good, says Tony. It's, it's randomness as part of what's so incomprehensible about it. Someone starts to walk home minutes away from where they are, and then it all goes bad. That is not life in Melbourne. That is not life in the Melbourne that all of us know. The death of Jill Maher, do you agree the system failed Jill Maher? Um, yeah, without a doubt. Bailey was on parole at the time of Jill's murder, waiting on a court appeal against a three-month sentence for a violent assault. He should have been in jail. From my recollection, Bailey, uh, in assaulting a male person in Geelong, um, broke his eye socket or gave him some severe facial injury. And he was found guilty of that in the magistrate's court and was given um, a three months um, term of imprisonment. Not, I would have thought, an unreasonable sentence given his horrendous uh, antecedents for violence. Now, he appealed against the severity of that sentence. He didn't appeal against his conviction. So the conviction was always going to stand. He appealed against the length of the term of imprisonment. Where are the risk assessments done? Where are the programs run? Where is the supervision done? Where is the monitoring? Where is the analysis compiled? It's not in the Adult Parole Board. It's in Corrections Victoria. The culture of parole in Victoria must and will change. Today, I make this firm declaration. The safety of the community will be the highest priority for the Adult Parole Board. It's the same mistake the police made when they didn't oppose bail. It's the same mistake the magistrate made when he granted bail. It's the same mistake Corrections Victoria made when they requested us 
not to take action until the appeal was heard. But we were the ultimate decision makers and we should take ultimate responsibility, which we do. Well, what I say is he should have gone into prison pending the outcome of his appeal because realistically he'd breached uh, his parole. So that system, you know, has been fixed up. Will it happen again? Probably will. We're able to reunite Gillian with the family um, to give them some closure um, and allow them to bury her. I see Jill's, Jill Maher's picture in the paper often and I think what a beautiful young woman cut off in her prime and the, the damage that has been done to the family. Though we can't be together right now, we are together in our thoughts and memories. Every murder is tragic for the family and friends of the victim. But in 35 years of crime reporting, there's a handful which have really impacted on the broader community. These are the cases where the victim is invariably totally innocent and the crime is totally random. Jill's was one of those. I couldn't have asked for more loyalty, happiness, commitment, love, and most importantly, fun from my Jill. Goodbye, my beautiful, funny girl. I love you forever. The families of most murder victims feel compelled to go to court to see the killer face to face. The Ma family going to the court was also a chance to represent their Jill. But a sterile court is a long way from a bloody crime scene. They're strangers, the accused and the family, yet they sit just metres apart in the Supreme Court brought together by one horrible, violent event. Adrian Bailey, his whole pattern of behaviour was violent, uh, aggressive, um, offending against, against women. Um... Jill lived a life full of family, friends and her beloved Tom. Jill was brutally raped and murdered and is never coming back. Justice has now been done. Police and prosecutors, we thank you. In 2013, Justice Geoffrey Nettle sentenced Bailey to life in prison with a non-parole period of 35 years, telling him it was a savage, violent rape of the gravest kind, committed upon a woman whom you knew was most certainly not consenting. But the justice system was not finished with Bailey. In March 2015, he was convicted of three additional rapes. On appeal, one was quashed, and a new minimum sentence set at 40 years. Adrian Bailey was dealt with for what he was, a serial predator with no realistic chance of rehabilitation. In my view, um, had we not caught Adrian Bailey, he wouldn't have stopped uh, and we would be dealing with a serial killer. Well, look, I was uh, relieved because uh, we were really concerned about, um, you know, having a, a person of that nature out there, a killer out in the streets, because um, the, the thing that you worry about is that they're going to strike again. And so, no, no, you know, my view is we put all the support we can into those sort of investigations in the early stages, and that's what we did. Their passion for what they do and for bringing home the victims to their families and seeking, sometimes it's not a closure, because I don't think if you lost someone that you love that you'd ever get closure, but to get that resolution for the family right through the court system, through to a guilty verdict and through to their jailing, they're amazing. The work they do with families, I don't think people actually see, you know, their day starts when someone else's day is ending in that respect. And it's the worst day of the family's lives to be told that your child, the person you love the most is killed. And these guys, I think, live, that, live through that, through the whole investigation that, you know, this is the saddest time of these people's lives. And they're a big part of that. And they're amazing. They're, they're just amazing people to work with. I never met her. Um... But, you know, we sort of 
I pick apart the ins and outs of, of her life and, and her final moments. And for whatever reason, this job, it sort of encourages a real connection. And so I guess along with that comes, you know, a hollow feeling. You know, I have great pride in being involved in that investigation and, and what we were all able to achieve. It's a tragedy and it's sad, you know, and there's, there's no winners. Jill Maher shouldn't be remembered as a victim, a cause, a point of protest, or a martyr. Adrian Bailey should be remembered for what he did. Jill Maher for what she was.